All right, so welcome to another video. At the moment, I am quite sick, so this week I figured that I would just share a chapter from my book on film scoring. This video will feature audio from the audiobook chapter on translating emotions into music. We'll take an in-depth look at emotions and how composers should approach them in their music. We'll discuss the issues involved with trying to use a template approach to writing emotional music, and even cover specific tools that you can use to better understand specific emotions and how they can inform the decisions you make while writing your music. Finally, we'll wrap up the whole video by seeing how these tools might be applied to a scene from one of my favorite books, Aragon, by Christopher Pollini. Before that, I want to take a quick moment to thank my amazing patrons. I appreciate each and every one of you, and I'm grateful to have you on the team as we continue to find new directions to take this channel. If you are interested in becoming a patron, the link is in the description of this video. All proceeds go towards helping me afford tuition for my classes. So, with that, let's get started. Emotion is intimately linked with music. It is an instinctive parameter that almost everyone seems to understand is crucial to the art form, but very few understand how to express it. You only need to look at any given online forum to see musicians of all different backgrounds asking, how can I write, insert generic emotion type, music? Only to get an answer along the lines of, you imbecile, you utter buffoon, you dairy-eyed, cabbage-headed, toe-breath fool. Music has no inherent emotion. Now, obviously, these kinds of snarky responses aren't helpful in any sense of the word, but neither are the questions. Bear with me. These questions have their heart in the right place, but they're missing the mark. Yes, music can portray emotion. This much is true. But you shouldn't start with the music. You should start with the emotion itself. The focus shouldn't be on finding cliches and templates to portray something as nuanced as an emotional experience. Instead, it is much better to gain an intimate understanding of the emotion itself and let the music grow organically from that experience. For all the focus that modern music tends to have on emotional expression, especially film music, it breaks my heart to know how little attention is typically given to understanding emotions at a fundamental level. Having spent the better part of my formative years studying psychology and training to be a therapist, this is something that I know all too well is crucial not only to your development as a composer, but as a human being as well. This concept of naming and understanding your emotions is at the core of many established and evidence-based therapy practices, and it should be at the core of your approach to musical storytelling as well. Emotions exist on a spectrum. They are many and varied, and no two experiences of a particular emotion are the same. I mean, the kind of happiness you feel while eating a bowl of Reese's Puffs is going to be very different from the kind of happiness you would feel on your wedding day. So, why should you be content to simply categorize them both as happy? Yet, if all you have is a template for writing happy music, that might be what you get stuck with. Instead, it is so much better to approach each emotion as a unique experience and learn how those experiences can write their own music. Now, perhaps I should give a more specific example. In one of the classes I took on film scoring, I was once given an assignment to write music to a scene from the 2006 movie Aquila and the Bee. In the scene, the titular character is practicing for a spelling bee when she glances at a picture of her late father and has a panic attack. In her mind, she revisits the memories of when she and her mother learned that her father had been killed in a shooting. She then uses her spelling practice as a way to take back control and refocus, escaping from the hell that is a panic attack. 
In this assignment, we were tasked to use a template for sad music that we had spent all week learning. I was taken completely off guard by this because a panic attack is not the same thing as sadness. There is a desperation, a need to either run or to fight, an overwhelming sense that danger is coming that can accompany a panic attack. It is not the same thing as sadness. Now, don't get me wrong. I won't say that the template was unhelpful. I have nothing but love and respect for the professor and musician who created the templates we learned. He even inspired the tools found in this book in the first place. However, it just did not feel appropriate for the nature of that particular scene. Instead of using the template we had learned, I focused on blending it with my own approach for presenting the dizzying and horrifying experience of a panic attack. Now, moments like this crop up all the time. As a musical storyteller, you will never be asked to score the same emotion twice. They might have the same generic name like sadness or joy or even fear, but the expression and the experience of that emotion that each character and, more importantly, your audience will have will always be unique. This is why you must be prepared to approach each piece by first addressing how the emotion can describe its own music instead of how a template can be forced to fit into the scene. Now, as a disclaimer, the questions and tools used in this chapter were carefully cultivated with the help of a close colleague of mine who works as a trauma therapist. We undertook a careful review of the peer-reviewed literature surrounding emotional expression and experiences and created a tool based on different functioning models for processing emotions. If you are deliberate in your use of this tool, it can be a powerful aid in not only understanding an emotional experience, but experiencing a bit of it yourself. You see, the human brain works in a way so that by focusing on the somatic and subjective experiences of an emotion, you tend to begin experiencing that emotion itself. I offer this as a warning. If you use this tool to process too many negative emotions in a row, you're setting yourself up for a real bad time. Fun and positive emotions are fine, but if you plan to visit a dark place, it is best to have an exit strategy. Be prepared with things to cheer you up on standby for when you're done. So with that in mind, let's get started. Unlike the previous two tools, we are not going to start this one by naming the emotion we're working with. This will be the last step, if you include it at all. The importance here is not on identifying a specific emotion, but rather understanding its subjective experience. Instead, our first step is to consider the general level of intensity, or the energy level that is being experienced. In this step, we are going to assign the emotion, a number on a scale of 1 to 5, based on how intense the experience is. However, this is not to say that this number is a standardized or objective measurement. There is no specific rubric for identifying exactly where each emotion measures on the scale. Rather, it is a series of questions meant to get you thinking about how powerful the emotional experience is. Start by picturing the scene and the emotion that you are attempting to capture. What would it feel like to live in that moment, to experience it firsthand? Once you are there, answer these questions. One, on a scale of one to five, what kind of impact does the emotion have on your heart rate? One, being no impact, you maintain your resting heart rate. And five, being your heart rate is beating so fast it feels ready to burst. Two, on a scale of one to five, what kind of impact does the emotion have on your breathing? One is no impact. Your breathing is normal. 
Five is you're finding it hard to breathe or you're out of breath. Three, on a scale of one to five, how intense do you perceive this emotion? One, being easily manageable, I'm in complete control. Five, being I am overwhelmed, this is the only thing I can focus on. Four, on a scale of one to five, how surprising was the event that triggered this emotional experience? One, I was expecting it. Five, it took me completely by surprise. Five, on a scale of one to five, what kind of consequences will the triggering event have? One being nothing changes for the character. This is a passing experience. Five, this event will have a lasting impact and consequences for the character. And six, on a scale of one to five, how important is this emotion to the story? One being, it's a passing event with little to no impact on the story. Five being, it is a major plot point or defining moment of the story. Don't overthink these things too much. Trust your gut and assign the numbers that feel appropriate to each question. Once you've answered each of them, add the numbers together and then divide them by six. This will give you the average answer for all six questions and the overall intensity or energy level of the emotional experience in general. Now, this exercise is meant to help get you in the right frame of mind to start exploring the somatic experience of the emotion itself. This is important because oftentimes understanding how your body reacts to an emotion is the key to re-experiencing it on command. As a little pro tip, learning how your body responds to being relaxed can actually be an excellent tool for teaching yourself how to deal with anxiety or stress. Now, some of these questions will seem a little repetitive, but they are still important to understand. Question number one is how does the emotional experience impact your heart rate? Question number two, how does the emotional experience impact your breathing? Question number three, how does the emotional experience impact your comfort level? And four, are there any other physical responses to this emotion? When answering these questions, don't focus on using numbers like we did previously. Instead, focus on writing a few sentences to describe each experience. Is your heartbeat fluttering? Does it feel like it skipped a beat or two? Does it feel like it could burst out of your chest at any moment? Or does it feel like it's been nailed in place with an icicle? Try to live in the experience and be as descriptive as you can. After all, the goal is to take these descriptions and translate them into music. That is a whole lot easier to do if you have a quality description to work with in the first place. A quick word on the last question. Are there any other physical responses to this emotion? This question is purposefully vague and open-ended. It's meant to be left up to interpretation so that you can use it as your catch-all for the different emotional experiences you will have to score. It can focus on an actual physical experience like sweating or feeling nauseous, or it can focus on more of a perceived physical experience like having a weight in the pit of your stomach. Regardless of how you answer, Focus on using descriptive language that can portray how the emotion is physically expressed and experienced throughout your body. Now, armed with a stronger understanding of the physical experience of your emotion, you should now be getting a clearer idea of what kind of emotion you are trying to portray. With an understanding of the specific somatic responses that make this particular experience unique, we can start to look more closely at the other subjective experiences of the emotion. First off, we should figure out what kind of experience it is. Is it a positive one? Is it a negative one? Is it somewhere in between? Figure out how you would classify the experience, but don't stop there. Once again, write a sentence or two describing why you made your decision. What specifically makes this experience negative or positive and to the degree that it is? Once you have your answer, start to think about what event or events actually triggered the emotion in the first place. As I mentioned earlier in this book, emotions do not exist in a vacuum. 
They are triggered and inspired by our perception and experiences of the world around us. Different events can improve or worsen your mood as the day progresses. Not only can events trigger emotions, but the degree to which these events were expected can also have a massive influence. Some emotions are just easier to manage when you know they're coming, while others will build up over time as the anticipation creates a more extreme experience. Some emotions are at their most gut-wrenching when they happen out of the blue, while others lose all potency and power if they have no buildup. For example, imagine that you are to lose a beloved pet. Is it better to have them die in a veterinarian's office after you were given a week's notice to say goodbyes? Or for them to die suddenly on a busy street after running in front of a speeding car? It's a morbid example, I know, I'm sorry. However, do you see how expectations of an emotion can shape its experience? Some people would find it more painful to undergo the heartbreaking ordeal of saying goodbye for an entire week with the knowledge that their time is running out. Others would find the pain of not being able to say goodbye to be much, much more heartbreaking. The point that I'm trying to make here is that our emotions are colored by the way we experience the world around us. And you need to consider this when trying to translate any emotional experience into music. Take some time to reflect on the particular emotion you are trying to capture. What event served as its catalyst? Was this event expected or not? Answer these questions and then spend a sentence or two describing how this impacts the experience of the character and audience. Keep in mind that the characters of a story are rarely aware of the music, so more often than not, you are playing to the audience's experience of the emotion instead. Another crucial idea to consider at this point is the perception of whether or not the triggering event was deserved. Both guilt and innocence are powerful lenses for coloring an emotion. The degree to which a particular emotion is felt is often colored by the knowledge of what role we played in the triggering event. Perhaps one of the most widely known examples of this is in the origin of Spider-Man. In Spider-Man, Peter Parker is presented with a chance to use his powers to stop a robbery. He ignores the chance to do good and allows the crime to be committed. Later, he discovers that his beloved uncle has been shot and killed by the very same robber that he had let escape. The guilt and shame that Peter feels at his failure to take action becomes a formative moment for him, where he commits to being Spider-Man. The knowledge that his uncle would still be alive if he had intervened haunts Peter for much of his life and greatly colors the emotional experience of that memory. It is not only about the pain of loss, but also the guilt of knowing that he could have prevented it all. Now, if Peter had not been present at the time of the robbery, then the loss of his uncle would have been colored much differently. The pain and the loss would still be there, but the crushing knowledge that he could have prevented it would not weigh him down, at least not to the same extent. Now, to use a much more positive example, how much more enjoyable is it to nail an audition or to win a competition when you know that the time and effort you put into it made you better than everyone you competed against? in comparison knowing that you cheated or that your opponent was sick, can make the same victory feel a little more hollow. Regardless of what kind of situation you are working with, take some time to consider what role the character played in setting up the triggering event for their emotion. Did they directly influence it, or did they have nothing to do with it? Did anyone have any influence at all in how things turned out? Take your time to consider this, and then write a few sentences to describe what role the character played in setting up their own triggering event, and how that role colors their experience of the emotion. The next natural question to ask is, what kind of impact does this emotion have on the character or story? This one may seem obvious, but it's important to nail down. We need to understand if this is a passing moment, or a character-defining one. 
the difference will be important for deciding how the music must be written. For example, is this moment in the story worthy of inspiring its own theme or just temporarily coloring another theme inspired by someone else? In the example of Peter Parker, his emotional experience was a character-defining one. The rest of his life will be spent as Spider-Man, upholding the values and virtues that his uncle passed on to him. It would be entirely appropriate to have some part of that tragedy color the character's theme throughout the story, and not just the scenes where he struggles with the experience. With all the work you've placed in so far, this question shouldn't be too difficult to answer. Simply take a moment to write a few sentences on whether or not this experience is central to the story, and why or why not. Finally, the very last two questions we want to explore have to do with what actions are inspired by and taken after these emotions. And this one is important. A lot of an emotion's experience is based on the conflict, or lack thereof, between how we want to act and how we can act. This kind of conflict is very common in good storytelling. It adds a whole new level to the emotional experience. The frustration of not being able to react the way you want adds additional color and emotion to the experience. Be as creative with these descriptions as you'd like. Some emotions are easy to describe. When you're sad, you feel like you want to cry. When you're angry, you might feel like you want to lash out at the world. Depending on where you are, these kinds of reactions may or may not be feasible. However, some experiences are even more nuanced. Returning to our Spider-Man example one last time, Peter Parker has many things that he wants to do in reaction to his emotions, chief amongst them being his desire to atone. He wants to rewind time and bring his uncle back, but he can't. No matter how desperately he may want to take back his actions, there is nothing he can do about it. Instead, he moves forward and attempts to atone by living his life in a manner that honors his uncle's life and lessons. Once again, I'm going to tell you to take your time. Write a few sentences, if not paragraphs, describing what kind of action this emotion calls your character and the audience to do. Then, discuss whether or not they can take these actions, or if they are forced to find relief elsewhere. What impact does this have on both of them, and more importantly, the story? Once you've done this, you're finished. One last optional step that you can take is to write down a few idioms, expressions, and or metaphors that are commonly used to describe a particular emotional experience. The benefit of these mini-tools is to provide a cultural lens through which an audience is likely already familiar with a type of emotional experience. They typically consist of highly descriptive language as well and can be useful for inspiring musical ideas and concepts. Some quick examples would be felt like a gut punch to describe rejection or butterflies in your stomach to describe young love and heart skipped a beat to describe surprise nerves or excitement. With that, it is now time to revisit our nine parameters one last time and jot down any ideas you may have for translating this emotional experience into a musical one. Consider which aspects of the emotion should play the largest role in inspiring your music. Then, go through each individual parameter and write down your initial thoughts on how each one can be used to portray the emotional experience. Use your knowledge of how each parameter can contribute to storytelling and don't worry about being hypercritical of yourself. Just trust your gut and write down the first things that come to mind for each one. In the next few pages, we will look at one last example from the inheritance cycle. In this example, we will be analyzing the emotions experienced in the hours before the Battle of Farthendur. The heroes have been warned of a massive army of Urgles approaching the dwarven city of Trondheim. They are being led by a powerful shade, and greatly outnumber both the Varden and Dwarven forces. With only a few days of notice, the armies have prepared as much as they can, and have sent messengers to all of their allies, with a warning of what is to come. It's too late 
to summon reinforcements, and all they can hope is to give their allies enough notice so that they will not be surprised if the city is taken. The specific scene we will be analyzing for motion is the final hours before the battle begins. The army is summoned and has prepared as much as they can. Now they can do nothing more but wait for the approaching threat. Hours pass, and the heroes are left with only their fear and anxieties of the impending battle. Emotion in Music Tool Example Energy Level Impact on Heart Rate 4. The heroes are anxious, with their hearts beating quickly, but the battle has not yet arrived and the full impact of what is to come hasn't quite hit them yet. 2. Impact on Breathing 1. The heroes are anxious, but their breathing has not changed yet. They are left with their thoughts as they wait for hours until the battle begins, even managing to get some sleep. 3. Perception of Intensity 4. The anxiety is almost maddening. The heroes dread the upcoming battle, but almost wish it would hurry up and arrive. The waiting almost feels worse than the battle itself. 4. Readiness and Surprise Factor Score, 2. The news of the approaching army was a surprise, but by this point, several days have passed, and the surprise has worn off. Now they know that the impending battle is inevitable. 5. Consequences and Impact Score, 5. Everything is going to ride on the outcome of this battle. If the Varden are defeated and Aragon and Saphira captured, there will be no hope of Galbatorx ever being defeated. 6. How important is this emotion to the story? Score, 3. This moment is a defining one, but the emotions themselves don't impact the story too much. However, the anxiety that precedes battle does become a recurring theme throughout the series, so while this part particular experience isn't crucial to the story itself, the generalized emotional experience will return many times. Average across all scores and total intensity and energy level score for this emotion, 3.2. Emotional descriptors, physical experience. 1. Impact on heart rate. So the characters' heart rates are beating well above average. They are experiencing an intense and almost maddening amount of anxiety in the hours before the battle begins. The exact impact on their heart rate probably goes up and down over time as they wait and find ways to distract themselves. However, frequent false alarms result in unpleasant spikes of both their anxiety and heart rates. 2. Impact on Breathing the character's breathing remains relatively regular, in direct contrast to their heart rates. The anxiety they experience doesn't have too severe of an impact on their breathing patterns until they experience a false alarm, in which the adrenaline rush forces their hearts to race and their breathing to match. 3. Impact on Comfort Level The characters are deeply uncomfortable. They are left with almost nothing but their thoughts to occupy them. As the armies make preparations for the battle, there is no way to escape the heat and fumes being created by the boiling pitch and torches of the army. The battle is to take place within the giant mountain of Farthendur, and there's no breeze to offer any kind of relief. To make things even worse, the eerie sound of various soldiers sharpening their weapons creates a chorus of dissonant, scraping noises that gets on the nerves of everyone in the area. 4. Are there any other physical responses to this emotion? While they're not directly associated with the emotions itself, the characters are exhausted and stiff. They must stay prepared for battle, and as time stretches by, their eyes get heavy and their muscles feel stiff. Aragon does manage to get some sleep, but it's plagued by nightmares and fits until he is woken by the arrival of the enemy. Subjective Experiences 1. Is this a positive or negative emotion? 
This experience is overwhelmingly negative. The heroes are left with only their thoughts, as danger, unlike anything they have ever experienced, draws relentlessly nearer. 2. Was whatever triggered the emotion expected or unexpected? Yes and no. The news of the approaching army was a very nasty surprise, but enough time has passed for the characters to understand and accept the news. Now, the fact that war and death are rapidly approaching is completely understood, with the knowledge that there is nothing they can do to stop it. 3. Was whatever triggered the emotion event deserved? No. As far as the characters knew, their location had been secret. They are unaware of the traitors in their midst and are now left with the dread of having no idea how the enemy found them. 4. What kind of impact does this emotion have on the character or story? Now, this emotion sets up a pivotal moment in the story, the climactic battle for Farthendur. While the battle itself is incredibly important to the development of both the characters and the story, this particular moment and its emotional experience is not. Now, while this emotional experience will be important to capture in the scene, it will not be one that needs to inform the identity of any of the characters' themes in general. Desired Behavioral Response 1. How do you want to react? The characters desperately want to protect their loved ones and the cause that they fight for. They simultaneously dread the inevitable battle and just wish it would hurry up and arrive. They want to stop sitting with their thoughts and actually act on them. 2. How can you react? The characters are powerless to affect time. They must wait for the battle to begin and can't make it start sooner. Instead, they must sit patiently and try to keep their thoughts and anxieties from getting the better of them. Optional final step. What kinds of idioms, expressions, or metaphors are commonly used to describe this emotion. Two common expressions could be describing the anxiety as waves of anxiety coming and going, ebbing and flowing, or a cold dread. Nine parameters of music applied. Example. Tempo. The characters are painfully aware of how slowly time is passing before the battle, so the tempo should have a very slow BPM and primary pulse. I'm thinking around 60 beats per minute or maybe slower. However, there is an important juxtaposition of fast heartbeats and steady breathing in this emotional experience. So there should be a subtle, quicker pulse just below the surface in the background, similar to what we saw in Vogel im Kafig from Attack on Titan. Rhythm. The primary pulse should have a steady and symmetrical rhythm, something to portray the relentless but slow passage of time. The second pulse should also have a steady and symmetrical rhythm to keep with this experience, but it should contribute an ever so subtle amount of syncopation to the general feel of the music. Pitch. This piece strikes me as being more rhythmic than melodic. I think most of the pitches used should be dissonant and slow-moving. We're looking to create more of an ambience with this scene than a musical statement. The goal should be to convey some of the discomfort the characters are experiencing. Two great strategies to accomplish this are to remove any trace of a lyrical and steady melody, as well as to introduce some dissonance to the sound. One option for the melody could be to use the top line of a homophonic chord progression with very little movement and only the most essential embellishing tones used to give it an identity. Articulation The characters experience frequent false alarms as the messengers run throughout the camps. One way to try and capture this is to use long, sustained, but morphing textures with accented attacks. Harmony here, I think using specific chord relationships could work well. In particular, minor triads separated by a minor third or tritone would fit really well with the mood. 
simple minor triad tertiary harmony could also be appropriate. Either way, non-functional harmony seems like a perfect fit for the seemingly functionless time spent waiting for the battle to begin. A super slow harmonic rhythm, I'm talking maybe one chord per entire phrases, seems like a solid strategy for emphasizing how slow the time seems to pass, while also contributing to the atmospheric nature of the music. Additional color tones could be added and removed at a pace of one or two measures at a time to give the illusion of forward-moving momentum without actually changing the chords. Timbre. So my gut reaction for morphing and atmospheric moments like this tends to be synths, but that just doesn't seem appropriate for a Tolkien fantasy-type setting. So instead, I want to try and emulate synths through the use of more traditional instruments. To this end, I think strings and choir would be a great combination. They can work together to create a kind of morphing pads of harmony and subtle melodies, while the percussion takes the foreground with the pulse and rhythmic figures. The instrumentation size should ebb and flow to mimic the emotional spikes of false alarms. And a strong reverb would be really fun to experiment with since the battle does take place inside of a ridiculously massive mountain cavern. Register. I think the vast majority of this piece should fit within the upper register, with only the percussion existing in the mid and low registers. Dread is often described as being cold in many idioms and expressions within Western culture. And sounds are often described as being cold when they lack lower registers and frequencies. Emphasizing the upper register with only higher pitched sounds and sparse lower sounds could result in a really eerie feeling. Dynamics. I want to use instrumentation size to manipulate the dynamics of the pads as they morph. Throughout a phrase, some instruments will increase in volume or crescendo, while others will decrease or decrescendo to create a morphing timbre, while the other instruments join in and drop out periodically to also contribute to the morphing nature of the sound and manipulate the overall volume. These shifts in volume should be used like waves to portray the ebbing and flowing of anxiety as the false alarms come and go. Texture. Here, the foreground will consist of the primary slow rhythmic figure. The midground will consist of the melodic voices of the harmony. And the background will consist of the remaining harmonic voices and the secondary rhythmic figure. Now, as a special note, while I dissected this scene and came up with some plausible musical ideas, another entirely valid approach to this type of scene would be to avoid music altogether. The lack of music can be a fantastic tool for enhancing the realism and the seriousness of scenes like this. If the goal is to make the audience experience the same level of dread and discomfort of the characters, you shouldn't underestimate the power of making them just sit in silence with the characters. And with that, we have reached the end of another video. I hope you found it helpful. If you enjoyed it, please share it with anyone else you think might find it useful. Once more, I'd like to thank my amazing patrons for making this video possible, as well as all of you who show your support for this channel through your amazing comments, emails, and messages. I appreciate each of you more than I can say. So with that, keep studying, keep working hard, and keep writing new music.